Before we start today's video, I'd like to announce that I have launched a Patreon to help support the channel as our community of fellow detectives continues to grow. Joining my Patreon as a patron is totally optional, but if you are interested in supporting the channel as we continue to grow, that choice is now available to you with two separate tiers, including a $10 per month tier that includes exclusive content once a month. Also, if you sign up before April 19th, I will send you a personalized postcard to express my thanks. And now, into the video. Greetings, fellow detectives. Wizard Kitten here, bringing you a new Nancy Drew analysis video. Today's video is a bit historical in nature and will take us on a deep dive of the Nancy Drew PC adventure game canon. In doing so, I plan to present my theory that there are in fact four distinct eras or stages in Nancy's illustrious computer history. This is a theory that I have personally had for a very long time. But in the interest of sharing it with you all, I've decided to really flesh it out and do a bunch of research. This will hopefully also help us decide once and for all which era of Nancy Drew games was truly the golden age. A brief warning, this video does contain some mild plot spoilers for the following games that I use as examples in illustrating some of my points. Danger by Design, Creature of Kapu Cave, White Wolf of Icicle Creek, the Silent Spy, Ghost of Thornton Hall, The Captive Curse, and Tomb of the Lost Queen. The mentions are quite vague and fleeting, but I wanted to warn you nevertheless. Now the eras of Nancy Drew games are very closely linked to the history of the company who made them, her interactive. This is where the research part comes in, but let's start with a framework and delineate what I believe the four eras of the Nancy Drew games are. First, the classical era. This era spans from the original Secrets Can Kill, released in 1998, all the way to Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon, released in 2005. During this seven-year period, Her Interactive released 13 mysteries. This era is characterized primarily by games that take place in the United States, excluding Curse of Blackmore Manor, relatively few puzzles, but also relatively deep storylines and characters, older styles of animation, navigation, and interface, and shorter overall gameplay times. Second, the Renaissance era. This era spans from Danger by Design, released in 2006, and Shadow at the Water's Edge, released in 2010. During this four-year period, Her Interactive released 10 mysteries. This era is characterized primarily by games that take place outside of the United States, or in more quote-unquote exciting destinations in the U.S., like Hawaii and New Orleans. A heavy emphasis on puzzles, advancing design, exploration into different story structures, puzzle types, and character personalities, and longer mysteries. Third, the modern era. This era spans from The Captive Curse, released in 2011, and Sea of Darkness, released in 2015. During this four-year period, Her Interactive released nine mysteries. This era is characterized primarily by beautifully designed and animated characters and locations, long mysteries, complex storylines, and relatively unconventional scripts. And lastly, the postmodern era. This era spans from 2015 to the present day. During this six-year period, Her Interactive released one game, Midnight in Salem. This era is characterized by a huge shift in the company in terms of community engagement, transparency with fans, changes to the developers and staff, and game output rate. If you don't know how I feel about Midnight in Salem already, I'd recommend my review, where I comprehensively cover all the tea, so to speak. If we look at the eras closely, we can see several clear themes that divide them in terms of where Nancy solves mysteries, how she interacts with suspects, what she must do in order to ultimately crack cases, and how everything looks while she's doing it. When we look at these parameters, it's pretty easy to see how the games fall into each era, with distinct styles in each. Which begs the question, is any one era better than any of the others? 
So now, let's cover the strengths and weaknesses of each era. The classical era's biggest weakness is that the games were created in the late 90s and early 2000s. So the limitations of the technology at that time meant that the characters move like robots, with little to no facial expression, and the environments are mostly static. The dialogue can also be a little too concise or a little too function forward in some of the earliest classical era games, though this improves as the era continues. We also see a tendency for these games to be short and simple which isn't everyone's cup of tea when it comes to a mystery game. Beyond that, though, the classical era is really where the games shine in terms of plot, storyline, and game feel. Detectives who start playing Nancy Drew games in this era often have a very deep connection with the stories, the locations, the characters, and the soundtracks, all of which can quite literally shake them to their core with nostalgia. There is a great deal of depth within these classical games, but the stories also don't shove those details in your face. Detectives discover the details and the depth organically as they play, and because these games are simpler, it's honestly easy to get lost in their beauty and experience new things in replays that you never knew existed. They're like little treasure troves of goodness that keep delivering over and over again, but also rely a bit on the detective using their imagination. I believe that the reason for this is because there was so much heart put behind the first games in the series. Her Interactive was founded as a company in 1995, after it gained independence from its parent company, American Laser Games. The goal of this young company was clear. There weren't enough video games targeted to a female audience and they wanted to make sophisticated, high quality games to fill that gap. And they succeeded. The early games had a mission to design clever mysteries that would connect with a female audience. It doesn't feel like there were any ulterior motives or like they were only driven by monetary success. They wanted to make games that would mean something to people, which resulted in extremely meaningful scripts. What's interesting too is not all of these scripts were written by the same person. There is, in fact, quite a variety of writers within the classical era, including Anna Roth and Lisa Smith from Secrets Can Kill, Robert Rydell from Stay Tuned for Danger and Message in a Haunted Mansion, Aaron Brown for Treasure in the Royal Tower, The Final Scene, and Secret of the Scarlet Hand, and Anne Collins from Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake all the way up to Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon. One relative constant within this era, however, seems to be creative director Max Holacek, who is credited for Message in a Haunted Mansion all the way through Curse of Blackmore Manor. My theory, then, is that a relatively constant staff with a serious motivating drive led to part of the unmistakable feel that permeates the classical era. It's honestly this feeling that makes a lot of these games the best for many detectives, and I can't honestly say that I disagree. Then, with the release of Danger by Design in 2006, the Nancy Drew series entered the Renaissance era. It was at this point that the developers wanted to explore new ideas and concepts for Nancy. The general vibe is that they wanted bigger and better things for Nancy. It was time for her to go new places, do new things, see new sights, and encounter more and more puzzles. It was an attempt to awaken and invigorate the series now that it had 13 spectacular games under its belt. But did it succeed? I would say that this era is marked by inconsistency. There are some gems within this era, including my personal favorite game, Warnings at Waverly Academy, and a game that many other detectives enjoy, Phantom of Venice. But there are also some pretty solid flops, with Creature of Kapu Cave and Ransom of the Seven Ships being among the least favorite games for a solid chunk of detectives. What caused so many high highs and so many low lows? Probably all of the experimentation and probably some shifts in the developing staff. Mike Paganini was the creative director during the early Renaissance period, overseeing Danger by Design through Phantom of Venice. Ann Collins also returned as a scriptwriter all the way up to Trail of the Twister, accompanied by the return of Robert Rydell up to Ransom of the Seven Ships. Meanwhile, the late Renaissance period saw the arrival of a new creative director, Tim Burke, who would be with the series from Haunting of Castle Malloy all the way to Sea of Darkness. 
Overall, this means that we had some pretty consistent staff, though there were changes midway through the Renaissance era. And the feeling I get is that there was a major goal of creativity and experimentation. The classical era had a fairly consistent formula, but the Renaissance era does not. It seems likely that the developers saw this as a time to really explore where Nancy could go, both literally and metaphorically. Within the Renaissance era, Nancy goes to France, Hawaii, Canada, New Orleans, Italy, Ireland, the Bahamas, and Japan. A vast majority of these games were in unique and uncharted places. The trend was to bring Nancy to stand out areas, which already brings some uniqueness to their structure because of the changing cultures. So we have built-in variety, which naturally brings some inconsistency. The metaphorical places that Nancy can go were also really explored. The classical era games built on classic mystery themes, stuck with one, and really went for it. Murder, sabotage, hidden treasure, kidnappings, theft. The Renaissance era games tend to mix these ideas and work to go in multiple directions at once. For example, Danger by Design starts with an undercover assignment, which eventually turns into a historical treasure hunt and also a spy subplot. Creature of Kapu Cave starts with a harmless internship, which turns into a sabotage mystery and then eventually some sort of grand pineapple heist. White Wolf of Icicle Creek starts with mysterious accidents, which turns into a biopic for Isis the Wolf and ends with a spy looking for valuables. Need I go on? This trend continues through nearly all of the Renaissance era, with some games being more successful at executing this trend than others. Some end up with meandering plots and conflicting subplots, while others end up with beautifully designed, intricate, and cohesive storylines. Creativity and exploration can reveal some of the most beautiful things that our world has seen, but it also leaves one more open to flaws. In my opinion, at least, this is exactly the reason why the Renaissance era is the most inconsistent. Which brings us next to the modern era, beginning with the release of The Captive Curse in 2011 and ending with Sea of Darkness in 2015. This era brought us some of the most vibrant, successful visuals and graphics. The characters feel real and dynamic. They don't move the same way each time, and the nuances of their emotions are beautifully expressed. The environments are similarly designed in that the depth of the colors, the detail in the design, the sharpness in the lines, and the movement within the scenes are all chef's kiss. But while the Renaissance era brought us experimentation in writing, location, and plot, the modern era brought us a very clear intention. We're going to be provocative. We established a solid base for Nancy in the classical era, experimented and tried new things in the Renaissance era, and now we have a pretty solid idea of what Nancy can accomplish as a detective. So within that formula, let's add a dash of deeper, darker concepts. Think mass paranoia in the captive curse, or generations of familial discord, greed, and murder in Ghost of Thornton Hall. Then, let's make sure that our characters have some really noticeable distinguishing features and are so mystifying that it's no wonder that they're entrenched in such a weird mystery. Think Patrick Dowsett from The Shattered Medallion, or Ryan Kilpatrick from The Deadly Device. Finally, let's go for a more open-ended approach to ending the mysteries, because really, in life, are mysteries ever really solved? Aren't unanswered questions more realistic? Think the lack of closure regarding Revenant in The Silent Spy, or the unresolved smuggling and Daughters of Nefertari subplots in Tomb of the Lost Queen. Now, as I mentioned before, the creative director of the late Renaissance era and all through the modern era was Tim Burke. We saw gleans of the modern era style with games like Shadow at the Water's Edge, playing with deep, dark subject matters, like familial guilt and the balance of tradition and modernity. It seems likely, though, that creative director Tim Burke was not the main reason for this shift in the way the stories were told and the games were structured. Instead, we have the arrival of none other than Nicholas Nick Blahunka. Blahunka is credited as a writer on Warnings at Waverly Academy and Trail of the Twister, 
but his first story concept credit is for Shadow at the Water's Edge. This trend, Lahanka as story concept leader and writer, then extended all the way to Sea of Darkness. So we see that he likely got his feet wet with his first story concept in Shadow at the Water's Edge, taking on more of the Renaissance-era characteristics for his first go at designing a Nancy Drew mystery. But after that, full steam ahead. I theorize that Burke leaned more towards Blahunka's style to begin with, but the modern era style didn't really start until the two began to work together, with Blahunka being a major influence. One of you fellow detectives, Friday Lambda, described this modern era phenomenon really well in a comment on one of my recent videos, so I will be quoting that comment here. As for writing style, the modern games focus extensively on modern and postmodern writing. This style of writing focuses on fractures, disconnect with the past, experimentation, a sense of longing for something lost, and individualism. Postmodern writing is the same thing, except you revel in this disorder. You find enjoyment and happiness out of it. The problem with such writing is two things. One, modern writing usually doesn't need a story, and two, it makes the story's flow fall apart. I absolutely agree that this is exactly what we see with the modern games. They tend towards chaotic, disorganized, incomplete, or trendy, all in the name of being contemporary or edgy. This isn't inherently a problem in story writing, and I'm sure many people enjoy this style as a whole. But what happens when this style is applied to a mystery formula at the same time that the games shift to a heavy focus on puzzles? The story ultimately gets lost. And again, this may not be an issue for some detectives who enjoy a little bit more variety, openness, challenge, or flexibility within their Nancy Drew games. Ultimately, this style simply does not focus on a coherent plot that is neatly uncovered and solved while adding in depth to the characters. Everything is a lot more complicated than that. Neat resolutions are not a thing. Flexible endings that are heavily open to interpretation are. Character arcs are not a thing. Wildly unpredictable, zany characters are. Puzzles that become part of the plot are not a thing. Challenges and puzzles that have no bearing on the mystery story and are there purely for enjoyment and or frustration depending on how you view them are. This is the story time and again for the modern era Nancy Drew games. And finally, we have the postmodern era, which began in 2015 after Sea of Darkness was released and spans up to the present moment. I think I'm being generous when I call this era postmodern, honestly, because a more apt term for the era would perhaps be the apocalyptic one. In a fantastic article titled The Case of the Disappearing Nancy Drew Games, writer Elizabeth Ballow tells us the sad, sad story of the postmodern era. This article is linked in the description below, and I will summarize it here. In March of 2015, recently hired CEO Penny Milliken cut over half of her Interactive's employees, many of whom had been working there for more than a decade. These cuts were abrupt and unexpected. Additionally, Lonnie Manella, who had voiced Nancy since the series' inception, would no longer be returning to voice the iconic detective. The series came to a sudden halt, with the game whose trailer was revealed at the end of Sea of Darkness, Midnight in Salem, nowhere in sight. The release date for Midnight in Salem, initially set for fall 2015, was pushed back to sometime in 2016 due to a planned shift to the Unity engine. Fans waited patiently for months, only to learn that the game was pushed back to Spring 2019. Lo and behold, Spring 2019 came and went. But don't worry, you'll have it in October 2019, they said. And lied. Because that day came and went, and Midnight in Salem was not released until December 3rd, 2019. After waiting almost five years, Midnight in Salem was released with typos, mistakes in audio recordings, a faulty and incomplete navigation system, graphics that were not half of what was promised to fans, especially since this was supposed to be the main reason for switching to Unity in the first place, and a credit scroll longer than the Nile due to a great deal of outsourcing. 
as I said, apocalyptic, a joke. The postmodern era was also characterized by a strange and sudden shift in the way that her interactive communicated with fans. A company that previously did compelling behind-the-scenes videos of the game design and crafting process shifted to vacuous social media posts offering sales based off of obscure holidays. Look guys, it's National Hug a Sheep Day, so Haunting of Castle Malloy is 20% off. <sighs> Frequent blog posts with hidden puzzles that laid hints to future games vanished, and in their place came infrequent blogs advertising sales based off of obscure holidays. Happy National Ice Cream Day, Alibi and Ashes is 15% off. Ugh. Transparent, honest, and two-way communication with fans disappeared. And instead, the company deleted all past communications about Midnight in Salem, and threads that criticized her interactive's new communication strategy suddenly disappeared. I should say that her interactive vehemently denies this, but feel free to control F for Midnight in Salem before it was released and see how much you can find. And unfortunately, we are still deeply immersed within this era of the Nancy Drew games. When directly asked, her interactive will say that they are working on a 34th Nancy Drew mystery, but have not released a single shred of information about that game or its progress. Sound familiar? Silence and empty promises have become the defining feature of the postmodern era, and I do not see us leaving any time soon. But that grim note aside, let's look back more fondly at the three actually productive eras within the theory the Classical Era, the Renaissance Era, and the Modern Era. After our investigation, can we decide which era was the best? Unfortunately, I don't think so, because of two things. First, the era in which you enter the series plays a huge role in what you come to expect and love in a Nancy Drew game. The game that hooked you and made you fall in love with the series informs your expectations about how the game should look, how it should play, what the puzzle should be like, and what the story should feel like. For example, my first game was the final scene, and so the lower quality character animations and more stagnant environments were not something that bothered me from the outset. The story and the intricate plot is really what hooked me, and so that's what I really require in a good Nancy Drew game. If I want that same feeling of excitement and discovery again, then that is truly what I need. Second, the era that you gravitate towards is going to be heavily dependent on what you personally care about in a mystery or video game. If your goal is to play a video game because you want to challenge and want to solve a ton of puzzles, then you're going to find the classical era quite dull, while the modern era is going to be much more your cup of tea. If you're like me and a mystery's plot is really your top priority, then that pattern is reversed. So for me personally, the classical era is by far the best as a whole though one of my top five games falls in the Renaissance era, Warnings at Waverly Academy, and two in the modern era, Ghost of Thornton Hall and Sea of Darkness. But what do you think, fellow detectives? Which era do you think is the best? Do you agree with my theory of the Nancy Drew eras or not? Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments section down below. And as always, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more Nancy Drew and Sims 4 content. Thank you so much for watching, fellow detectives. I will see you soon.